Pirates began in 2002 when I was commissioned by the New York Times to write a freelance piece for their museum's special section about the Witta Pirate Museum in Provincetown, Cape Cod. The museum contains artifacts recovered from the Witta Pirate Ship that crashed during a fierce nor'easter off the coast of Wellfleet in Cape Cod in 1717. Prior to writing this article, I didn't know much about pirates, except what I had read in books and seen in movies. I thought all pirates had a pet parrot, like Long John Silver in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island, or looked like the handsome and fit Errol Flynn in the 1935 movie Captain Blood, or walked, talked, and wore eyeshadow like Jack Sparrow in the movies, Pirates of the Caribbean. <laughs> Looking at the everyday artifacts recovered from the pirate ship, silver coins, cutlery, pewter plates, a teapot with the shoulder blade of a pirate, pistols, cannon, navigational instruments, medical supplies, and even a size five shoe leg bone, and silk stocking, I realized that these mythological figures were just ordinary men. The legend of Captain Samuel Bellamy and his love interest, Maria Hallett, told me that pirates had connections on land. They had families and communities that we didn't know much about. My previous book, The Pirate Next Door, The Untold Story of 18th Century Pirates, Wives, Families, and Communities, which was my dissertation at Georgetown, and I rewrote to turn it into this book, delves into the inner lives of pirates, their faiths, communal ties, and great loves. You'll hear about the wives, families, and communities of four pirates from the golden age of piracy who were active from 1695 to 1720. One of the most remarkable things my research revealed is the role that women played in the lives of pirates. It's a much larger role than has been acknowledged in previous pirate literature. And you will see that behind many a pirate was a strong woman on land. Though pirates were active up and down the eastern seaboard of the United States and the Caribbean, I chose to focus specifically on four pirates who operated in New England. This area was a hub of pirate activity, and I chose these four pirate captains in particular because they were all married, except for Sam Bellamy, who had an intended. All interacted with each other at some point or another, and because all of them were involved, in some cases quite actively involved, in the larger land-based community. These men are Sam Bellamy of, Captain, of Cape Cod, Paul Grave Williams of Block Island, William Kidd of New York, and Samuel Burgess of New York. And while I focus on these four men, my research included the lives of 80 married pirates. Their stories help craft a picture of the wider world of pirates and the surprising sense of community these men shared. As I was writing The Pirate Next Door, I kept encountering evidence of this mysterious woman who seemed oddly on the periphery of the story of the notorious Captain Kidd. Even the influential and authoritative early source book on pirates called A General History of the Robberies and Murderers of the Most Notorious Pirates by Captain Charles Johnson, did not include Sarah in the lengthy chapter on Captain Kidd. Sarah was alive at the time the book was published in London in 1724, and it would have been possible for the author to interview her or people who knew her. Finding Sarah's initials, SK, scratched on a colonial document at an archive in Boston, started me on a thrilling journey to learn more about her. I would soon learn that her initials marked the spot where love and law divide. 
To research Sarah's story, I had to use a variety of sources because women left little record of their affairs. Most women, including Sarah, could not write. Men owned all the property and exercised most of the legal rights at the time. I read the contextual history of pirates and of the time period to learn the political, economic, and cultural events that shaped Sarah's life. I was able to find some important primary sources of Sarah's, such as her petition to regain her seized property from the governor of New York, who came in and took it when Captain Kidd was imprisoned, and her last will and testament. Many of the ancient sources that I relied on were handwritten, and I transcribed over 250 of them to make them easier to work with. I visited archives in the places that Sarah and Captain Kidd had been, in New York, in Boston, and Rhode Island. I traced Sarah's steps in the surroundings she visited, especially in Manhattan, where she spent most of her life. I also found great resources in the Admiralty Papers at the National Archives in London. I found a rich cache of letters that were in a sea chest in Captain Samuel Burgess's pirate ship when it was captured by a British privateer in 1699. The letters were in the pirate's mailbag and contained a few letters from Captain Kidd's crewmen aboard the Adventure Galley to their wives and their wives to the, to the crewmen. The letters are dated from 1695 to 1699 and they show that correspondence was conducted thousands of miles across the globe between Indian Ocean pirates and North American colonists, and that there was successful and direct communications between New York and Madagascar and back again. No letters from Sarah and Captain Kidd were among these in the mailbag, and none have survived but there is every likelihood that they communicated during his three-year voyage through the Mariner's Mail Service, located on Ascension Island, a remote outpost in the Atlantic. New York merchant captains trading with pirates in Madagascar stopped for fresh turtle meat and, and dropped off and collected the mail that was left under a rock with a hole in it by the harbor. A letter from Sarah Horn, the wife of Kidd's crewman, Jacob Horn, was especially helpful and informative. Writing from her home in Flushing, New York, on June 5th, 1698, she told her husband, quote, we hear abundance of flying news about you. This meant that word had spread from port to port and ship to ship and there was trouble aboard the Adventure Galley. That trouble, we would later learn, was murder, mutiny, and piracy. To further understand the maritime world in which Captain Kidd was a part of, I attended a workshop at the National Archives in London and conducted research with scholars from the Prize Papers Project it's a collaborative effort of the National Archives with the University of Oldenburg in Germany to research and to categorize the thousands of yet unopened documents captured by the British in wartime in the 17th and 18th century. I examined trial records, depositions, personal correspondence, ship's logs, cargo inventories, and even a mariner's personal journal that was worn from wear in his front pocket. The manuscript room at the Library of Congress was a terrific resource, and Captain Kidd's own recorded statements gave strong evidence of his devotion to Sarah. Archivists and other historians I met were enthusiastic and helpful during my research, as was my loyal and dependable research assistant a cavalier King Charles Spaniel, named for a runaway pirate named Jeremiah Higgins. Here he is ins inspecting the galleys of the pirate's wife. 
Unfortunately, there are no contemporary paintings of Sarah Kidd. She can't be seen that way. But in 1911, the artist Jean-Léon Jérôme Fair created this painting of Captain Kidd in New York Harbor. The attractive, beautifully dressed woman with a lace fan holding Captain Kidd's hand on the deck of his ship is an interesting rendition of a woman who captured his attention. One contemporary of Sarah's described her as lovely and accomplished, and the woman in this painting is certainly lovely. Kid's velvet knee-length coat, a sword at his side, and a tri-cornered hat are historically accurate depictions of the attire of the period and what he would have worn as a successful sea captain. His gesture towards his lovely visitor, a suave, gentlemanly bow, and a warm clasp of her hand fits with the charming demeanor he was known to display. While this painting is a figment of the artist's imagination, and in 1911, we did not know the story of Captain Kidd and Sarah, there is coincidentally some historical semblance of truth in it. Born Sarah Bradley around 1670, the future pirate's wife arrived in New York from England with her widowed father and two brothers when she was 14 years old. At 15, she was married to one of the richest men in the colony, a much older, wealthy New York merchant named William Cox. When Cox died tragically four years later in 1689, Sarah married a Dutch merchant and mariner named John Ort. It was then that she met Captain William Kidd, a well-respected gentleman with whom she began a friendship. Captain Kidd was Sarah's third husband. Sarah was a twice-widowed, 21-year-old, considered one of the most eligible and sought-after women in New York. And she and Kidd married just two days after her second husband's death. <laughs> While the circumstances might appear suspect for Sarah and Kidd to marry, so soon after her second husband's untimely demise, Kidd and Sarah were stellar members of polite New York society. They were New York's power couple. No untoward behavior was ever proved. At the time of their marriage, the well-built, well-dressed 37-year-old sea captain, who spoke with a hint of a Scottish accent, was one of the most respected men in Manhattan. He was a celebrated war hero and a sought-after privateer. A privateer was hired by the government to legally plunder and seize enemy ships. He was a legal pirate. During wartime, the resources of warring countries were stretched to the limit, and privateers were hired hands who owned their own armed vessel and served as an auxiliary to England's navy. A privateer's assignment was detailed in a document called a letter of mark and reprisal. He had investors, and the captured prizes and cargo was shared with them. The captain and crew received a smaller portion of the take. There was sometimes a fine line between a legal privateer and an outlaw pirate. Many a privateer, once out at sea and beyond the reach of the authorities, turned pirate to avoid having to share the loot. There were other reasons. Turning pirate was an attractive alternative for some men, especially those with wives and families, because pirates lived in a highly civilized, democratic society. They were paid well when the going was good, and they were treated fairly. Pirates lived by a set of rules called articles, and each pirate had to sign his name, or if he could not, he left an X. To join the crew of the pirate ship was a commitment to be loyal to the brotherhood, as they were called. Each pirate had an equal vote, and most were given an equal share of the booty. There was a form of health insurance, 
life insurance, and retirement benefits. The pirate community was designed to support and maintain their relationships on land while they were at sea. For example, if a pirate died in action, his share of the booty was smuggled halfway around the world and given to his family. Turning pirate was a dangerous choice, but for some men, a married life and a short one was their motto. Sarah and Kid's wedding took place in Manhattan on a rainy Saturday, May 16, 1691. It was a day of high drama and grisly 17th century justice. England was at war with France. Pirates were plundering the high seas. And two traitors, the self-appointed governor, Jacob Lester, and his son-in-law, Jacob Milborn, were hanged for treason against King, Ma King William and Queen Mary in the public square. Sarah and Kidd attended the hanging after their wedding. <laughs> a public hanging was an event everyone turned out for. It was a carnival-like source of entertainment. The stark contrast of the day, a love match and an execution foreshadowed the dark drama that would be their life together. The kids lived in a mansion Sarah inherited from her first husband, located on the corner of Pearl and Hanover Street in the Hanover Square neighborhood of Manhattan. The waterfront property faced a wall, now called Wall Street, in the financial district. Coincidentally, their home is just a few blocks from the offices of my publisher, Hanover Square Press, an imprint of Harper Collins. I like to think that Sarah found my publisher for me. <laughs> Around 1692, Sarah gave birth to a daughter, Elizabeth. And in 1694, she had another daughter, little Sarah. During the colonial period, giving birth was a social and a bonding event where women looked after one another. Sarah's babies would have been, at, been born at home in a separate area away from the main living quarters. Men were not involved in the birthing process, so Captain Kidd would have been somewhere else. It was the job of women, relatives, neighbors, friends, and elders in the colony to act as midwives to assist in the delivery Special birthing linens were prepared and laid out. Sarah would have used a birthing stool, or perhaps a loved one held her upright and supported her as she progressed through labor. In the early stages, Sarah would have acted as the hostess of this festive occasion. It was an old English tradition for new mothers to serve groaning cakes, a sweet, nutritious, baked good made of spices, molasses, rum, apples, and carrots. And to go with it, groaning beer. As they waited for the blessed moment, the women would entertain themselves with gossip, jokes, and stories. In 1696, Captain Kidd was given a dream job. Two privateering commissions from the king, William III, his investors were some of the most important men in England, including the newly appointed governor of New York and Massachusetts, Richard Coote, known as Lord Belmont. Belmont's complicated relationship with Kidd would lead to Kidd's tragic dawn downfall. In his brand new ship, one that looked like this, the Adventure Galley was a 287 state-of-the-art warship with three tall masts, square rig sails, and 34 big guns. It was a hybrid ship called a galley, meaning that it could be rowed as well as sailed. His job was to hunt French enemy ships and to rid the seas of pirates who disrupted international trade. His commissions were for one year. <clears throat> His initially unsuccessful voyage led to frustration mutiny, and eventually, kids turn to piracy. 
Sarah was key to Kid's fight for his life against the men who accused him of turning from privateer to pirate. She and their daughters spent time with Kid on his pirate ship, and Sarah helped Kid hide his stolen treasure. As an accomplice to an outlaw, she was arrested and imprisoned in, with him in Boston. Once released, Sarah helped construct the narrative Captain Kidd presented in his defense. She ensured he was taken care of in jail. She tirelessly worked to help secure a pardon, and she even tried to help plot an escape. After Kidd was executed in 1701, <clears throat> Sarah lived another 40 years. She reinvented herself, and she managed to go from one half of a criminal outlaw couple to a high society socialite again. She secured her family's inheritance, remarried, had more children, and lived the rest of her life as a prominent and respectable citizen. She even learned how to write her full name. Sarah Kidd's extraordinary life is a rare example of the kind of life that pirates' wives lived during the golden age of piracy. Hers is a tale about love, marriage, motherhood, and survival. Sarah's life, and particularly her transformation from a New York socialite to a stateless outlaw, sheds new light on the political, economic, and cultural events of the late 17th and 18th centuries. From her, we learn about the economic hardships of widowhood, the political repercussions of piracy, the effects of war on the new and emerging colonial economies, the business of slavery. Her life tells a broader story about how certain women were able to assert their will and reclaim their agency within the oppressive strictures of colonial America. During her 74 years, Sarah lived through seven British monarchs, 21 New York governors, and she experienced firsthand the golden age of piracy. She survived four husbands and three of her five adult children. The Pirate's Wife, the remarkable true story of Sarah Kidd, recast the image of Captain Kidd from a diabolical pirate to a flawed but very decent man who tried to please his investors and protect his wife and his family. He was a pirate, but not one with a black heart. Sarah's initials, SK, scratched on a few colonial documents, gave clues to her existence. These bold pen strokes reveal a history we have only imagined, the dangerous, difficult, and thrilling life of a pirate's wife. They shed unexpected light on a young colonial woman caught up in a world of politics, passion, and grisly 18th century justice. The unknown SK is finally identified. She is Sarah Kidd, the First Lady of Pirates. I'd like to close by reading a passage from my book. I'm going to read from the prologue. Sarah Kidd lay in a weakened state in the bedroom of her Manhattan mansion. A highly contagious lethal disease raged through the colony, striking young and old, rich and poor, black or white. It was September 12, 1744, and the 74-year-old Sarah had taken first to her bed to get warm under her soft quilts and to rest her head on the goose down pillows. Then the chills, fever, and the fatigue set in. She was nearly certain that she had contracted a deadly disease everyone called diphtheria. As a precaution, 
she asked her family and their friends to stay at a safe distance. She arranged for soft foods and a soothing drink made from the medicinal herbs in her garden to be left outside her bedroom door. Her mind wandered in a fever-induced haze. She closed her eyes and remembered herself in another time and place. She was a young woman with her husband, Captain William Kidd, on his pirate ship, the St. Antonio, a vessel laden with gold, silver, and jewels. As his closest confidant, she learned that he'd buried some of his stolen treasure for safekeeping, and he described to her where it was hidden. She was not to tell a soul. For more than 40 years since his death in 1701, Sarah, the pirate's wife, kept his secret safe. Not even her five children knew. She alluded to it in her will, noting that she had assets in the city of New York and elsewhere. She did not identify elsewhere. Sarah worried about the consequences if her children were caught with stolen pirate loot. Her strong instincts told her it was best to leave well enough alone. As she thought back over her life, not all of her memories were fond ones, especially the time when she was a pirate's wife. But now the memory of the hardships and the heartbreak had softened, and Sarah wouldn't have, tried it, have traded it for anything. She felt proud, very proud, to have been a pirate's wife, and she wore the title as a badge of honor. Sarah repeated a prayer as her condition worsened. Almighty God, have mercy on my soul, and pardon and forgive me all my sins and offenses, so that I may, after this miserable life, arise with our Savior, Jesus Christ. She became delirious from the fever, and she shook uncontrollably. The sheets were soaked with her perspiration. Still, the thought of that secret weighed on her, as well-kept secrets often do. As she prayed for forgiveness, she may have thought it was time to identify elsewhere. To her three children who paced downstairs in the sitting room. It wasn't long before Sarah developed a sore throat that felt like a razor when she swallowed. She tried to speak, but it hurt so much she could only whisper. Her daughter, Elizabeth Kidd Troop, peeked through the keyhole to check on Sarah. The once vigorous woman now appeared very small in the many furnishings, among the many furnishings and tasseled curtains. She looked pale in her white cotton bedclothes and so frail, lying on her side, facing the door. Elizabeth saw her mother's lips moving, mouthing words, but she could not hear her. She strained through the keyhole to hear what she might be whispering. Elizabeth called for her brothers, Henry and William, who had stepped outside on the front stoop that faced the harbor. The cry of the seagull seemed to signal the alarm. Elizabeth told them to hurry. Each took a turn at the keyhole, looking and listening. Sarah's breathing was loud and strained as she gasped for air. The three of them looked at each other with tears in their eyes when the room fell silent. There was not a sound, not even a whisper. For over 300 years, treasure hunters have scoured the North American eastern seaboard, trying to find where elsewhere is. That secret is with Sarah, buried in the churchyard of Trinity Church Wall Street in Manhattan. Thank you. I'd be happy to take questions as long as they're not too hard. <laughs> Yes. Obviously, she had uh, religion and uh, a sense of duty and affection. Do you find any evidence of a moral conflict of 
dealing in probably taking life and uh, certainly taking goods from other people. So she didn't take life no, from other not people. No, she, but her husband. Her, yes, uh, uh, certainly there was a moral challenge there. But I think that Sarah would have um, been able to, or, or did deal with it out of just commitment to her husband. And she believed him, he told her that he was innocent. And he proclaimed that until the very end, before he was hung. And before he was hung, he said that he regretted the greatest sorrow was the shame that his wife and children would have to live with. So I think she did, she, she, she was able to uh, go with it. And, and Captain Kidd, I must say, um, yes, he did commit piracy, um, but, but many other pirates committed piracy and were pardoned. And he was specifically not pardoned because of his investors who were secretly investing in him to make profits from the war. So he was used as a scapegoat to, um, to tell other people not to turn pirate, but not to, also not to talk about who your investors are, being the king and the lords. <laughs> it was a shady time. <laughs> yes? Any uh, theories that came about or cropped up as a result of your research on where, if any, Captain Kidd's treasure might be buried from Oak Island to prison, Long Island? <laughs> Well, we do. <laughs> You're not the first to ask me that. <laughs> In fact, a movie producer called and said, can you just tell me where it is? <laughs> um, we do know that he buried treasure on Block Island. And we do know that that was then dug up because uh, Lord Belmont learned about it and sent a messenger and had it dug up. And it was returned to Boston. And it was put on the ship that um, carried Captain Kidd to England where he was um, put on trial. And so it, it, his, his uh, treasure actually became part of uh, Greenwich Hospital in London. As to where it is in the other parts, we don't know. Only Sarah knows. So after Captain Kidd was um, uh, executed, she, she was stigmatized. Um, the authorities came into her house they took everything, including the house and all her properties. And so she was destitute. And for two years she was destitute. And I'm sure that she was helped by Trinity Church, uh, Wall Street, which was where the kids uh, rented a pew, number four, and where that was Sarah's uh, sacred special place where she went for solace. She regained her position in society by remarrying. And that's what you had to do at the time. And Sarah was very persistent in doing it. She married four times. And of course, she started very young at age 15. Um, but, but she then regained her posture in society. She married um, Christopher Rousby, who was an East Jersey merchant. He was a decent man. He was not never wealthy, but they had a successful long marriage of 25 years. They had three sons, one of them named William. And um, she regained her position in society. All is forgiven when you're trying really hard. <laughs> yes. Well, that's a great question because we don't really know the history of many other wives. Um, Sarah was married to one of the no most notorious pirates in history, so I was able to construct her life uh, accordingly. But most of the pirates' wives could not write. Sarah Horn's letter was not written by her, that was written by someone else. And so the pirates' wives were invisible. 
as were many other women who not only were pirates' wives, but women in that time period were invisible because they couldn't write. Now, Sarah could read, but she couldn't write. And we are fortunate that Sarah left um, a good number of documents and a trail of, um, of, you know, she was married four times, so there's lots of real estate transactions and wills and inventories and things that, that, we, that I used to create her life. Um, but for the most part, we don't really know about the other pirates' wives. I do, I can tell you that most of them suffered terribly. You know, their husbands didn't get paychecks. And when their husbands were um, captured and uh, executed, these women were, were just destitute. There's an interesting document that I found from 1707 or 1709 that really is, hits the point that you're at, and that is that 47 Madagascar pirates' wives um, signed a petition to Queen Anne asking her to forgive their husbands and to let them keep his, their stolen pirate loot. <laughs> it seemed like an amazing document to find. I was shocked, but delighted. And, um, but that tells you that these women were desperate and they needed their husbands to be pardoned so they could, they could live. They're home with the children. And for years, these men were gone for years. And there was no way of, of, of unless they died in them, the booty was smuggled across the, the world. And that, that happened some of the time, and sometimes it went right in the pocket of some bad people. Um, but it was a terrible life to be a mariner's wife if your husband turned pirate.